Very welcome to this dialogue meeting on the Earth's environmental future and upcoming UN meetings. My name is Helena Lindemark and I'm the founder and chairperson of the 2020 Initiative Foundation, which is organizing this event. We were inspired by this book, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. It's written in 1962. And when I read it in 2014, I realized that we've known this for quite some time. And I also realized that in 1972, we had the first UN conference on sustainable development, really, the, first, the UN conference on the human environment on the theme, only one earth here in Stockholm where I'm based. And we still only have one earth. And at the Stockholm conference, the UN Environment Program was formed. And unless we would have had that conference, we wouldn't have had the 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Development Goals. And we wouldn't have had the climate agreement and all the conventions and things that we have now. So uh, I realized, and a lot of others with me, that 2022 could be and has to be an important milestone in sustainability. In 2015, we had two major agreements on the Sustainable Development Goals and the climate. So since 2015, 2022 is also about halfway to 2030 since both those agreements. And if we're gonna get action from today's leaders on these long-term goals, we need milestones on the way. So 2022 is perfect for that. So let me introduce now my colleague and moderator in this event, Stella Nodal. So Empregage works with the intentional decision model to facilitate the shift from all striving to be best in the world to all be best for the world. And this means moving from the machine metaphor to a more living metaphor. And in terms of sustainability, this implies going from ego and silos into eco and systems. And uh, work with the SDGs is empowered by the intentional decision model, and it also enforces the real impact. So please connect with me afterwards. You find what you need on empregage.com. Thank you. According to researchers, what we do during the coming two years is crucial for the future of humanity on planet Earth. And during these coming two years, there are several major UN meetings coming up. One of them is the UN Environment Assembly, uh, the first session, which will be digital due to the pandemic, UNEA 5.1, that will be held later in, in February. Uh, and after that, we have the UNEA 5.2, that, uh, uh, that will also be a celebration of UNEP 50 years or UNEP at 50. And later on in June, 2022, there is a plan for a Stockholm plus 50 conference. So what we will discuss during this dialogue meeting today is how could uh, these upcoming UN meetings and conferences be mutually reinforcing so we really get into action to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030. And if we need, if we're going to reach those goals, we need to act locally and work together. And during the pandemic, we've really seen that we can do this and we can work digitally and connect all over the world. So our proposal within the 2020 Initiative Foundation is that instead of just having one conference in Stockholm, one conference in Nairobi and maybe one in Rio, we need to have conferences all over the world that are connected digitally to be global. And that way we could get more engagement uh, locally all over the world, we can have lower CO2 emissions from traveling and it would be also more pandemic safe. And we also need to understand or to realize that collaboration and partnership is crucial to reach the SDGs. This is a compass uh, that guides us on the way. It shows that the SDGs that are th at the bottom that are related to nature are the basis for our survival on this planet. Uh, and the ones that are related to education, economy, innovation, and lifestyle, and also the ones related to law, for example, can be used as tools for creating sustainable societies, the well being of individuals, and for solving all the damage that we've done to nature. And then we put the partnership goal in the middle because we need to leave the silo thinking and work together on this. We're in this together. 
So very welcome to Accelerate Sustainability Together in this dialogue meeting. And remember that we have two ears and one mouth for one reason. So try to listen more than you talk in the meetings, in the dialogue meetings later on. And remember to leave no one behind. Thank you very much and very welcome again. It's an honor to be able to introduce our first speaker today, Ambassador Johanna lissinger kites from the Swedish Ministry of the Environment. Johanna is the ambassador appointed by the Swedish government to lead the work on the planned Stockholm Plus 50 UN conference. Our main question to you today is, how can Stockholm Plus 50 contribute to strengthening actions for nature to achieve the SDGs? So very welcome, Johanna. Yeah, you're welcome, Johanna, and um, take it away. <laughs> thank you very much, Stellan, and thank you, Helena, for inviting me to speak today's dialogue meetings. And um, a good morning, uh, good afternoon to colleagues around the world joining this dialogue today. I'm very much looking forward to be listening to uh, most of the presentation here today. Uh, at the outset, before I start, let me just underline that what I present here today uh, is our thinking up to now on Stockholm Plus 50. And this, of course, as you understand, will evolve over time as we continue to consult with member states, with all relevant stakeholders, um, at occasions like this one today, for example. I think we all know that the message from science is very clear. We find ourselves at a critical juncture, recognizing that the scale and the urgency of climate and biodiversity crisis and taking actions based on the linkages between them has become critical to humanity's continued well being for our generation and for future generations. Policy debates uh, about this complex and interlinked set of issues, reducing biodiversity, loss, mitigating, adapting to climate change, achieving sustainable and economic and social development, sustainable consumption and production patterns. Um, circularity and recovering and rebuilding from COVID-19 are, as Helena said in her introduction, very often conducted in silos and sometimes they are also even working against each other. Therefore, we are working towards the Stockholm Plus 50 that offers a chance for nations and stakeholders to work across those silos to develop synergistic win-win solutions for these very intervened challenges and opportunities. Uh, I heard before we started that there were uh, colleagues joining here today that um, were in Stockholm 50, well not 50 years ago, but almost 50 years ago now. Um, and since then, since the first conference on the human environment took place in 1972, our global population has doubled, the extraction of materials has tripled, gross domestic product has quadrupled. And looking at this and looking at one of the key messages from the 2019 Global Sustainable Development Report is that current moods of production and consumption may be unsustainable if trade-offs related to human well-being, equality and environmental protection are not addressed. And this will represent a challenge for achieving the whole 2030 agenda. Um, some of you may have seen the UN 75 declaration that was agreed uh, at last year's UNGA. And the declaration is stating very clearly that we have an historic opportunity to build back better and greener. We need to immediately curb greenhouse gas emissions and achieve sustainable consumption and production patterns in line with applicable state commitments to the Paris Agreement and in line with the 2030 agenda. This cannot wait. It's a very clear message that we agreed upon in the UN 75 declaration. So, so why do I spend time to give this somehow descriptive background uh, when I think most of us attending here today are just or too well aware about this? Because it is important and it is describing both the challenges we face, but also the urgency we need to act with and that we have an opportunity to reset our economies and redefine our relationship to nature or to the human environment, to use the title from 1972. Uh, countries, as we know, has different capacities and capabilities and different national circumstances. There is no solution that fits everyone. 
And working ahead, it is important to always bear this in mind in defining priorities and looking for solutions and involving all stakeholders. Let me just say a few uh, lines and comments on where we are from a process perspective. And again, I think connecting back to what Helena said in her introduction, uh, between now and 2022 in June, when we envisage Stockholm Plus 50 to take place, there are a series of major important environmental meetings. And from our side, uh, to ensure that we create Stockholm Plus 50 in a way that we are contributing to value to existing processes, we are of course looking at those meetings, not at least UNIA 5 and UNIFAT 50, very closely to add to the bigger picture. Uh, yesterday, together with Kenya, um, we presented um, an enabling resolution for Stockholm Plus 50 in New York. So we will also soon to start uh, informal consultations uh, on Stockholm Plus 50. And so where do, in what four areas would we see that Stockholm Plus 50 can contribute? The first one, we are working towards the Stockholm Plus 50 that connect to the UN 75 declaration and that underline the interconnected nature of our challenges and the importance of multilateralism. We also looking at a Stockholm Plus 50 that contributes to redefining our relationship to nature through accelerated actions for sustainable consumption and production, leaving no one behind. Thirdly, a Stockholm Plus 50 with a meaningful participation by youth, but also seeking to deliver an outcome inspired and relevant to the youth. And fourthly, a Stockholm Plus 50 as an opportune movement through sustainable consumption of production, contributing to building forward better and greener. With respect to concrete deliverables, Sweden envisaged a declaration that commemorates 1972 Stockholm Conference and charts a way for forward in terms of highlighting key actions that governments and other stakeholders will take, both in the shorter and longer term, to accelerate progress towards sustainable consumption and production, advancing nature-based solutions globally, and ensuring that those actions are designed to reduce inequalities and a benefit, especially the poor and vulnerable. The vision for such a declaration would be to mobilize the global community behind strength and cooperation and accelerated innovation actions on the global goals. And that, colleagues, is how we see that Stockholm Plus 50 will contribute to strengthen actions for nature to achieve the SDGs, which was the set title for my presentation here today. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Johanna. Um, you have put your finger on a lot of the big topics and also urgent topics, but also possibilities. And uh, this is a great uh, first presentation. We will uh, directly move into the next uh, speaker. And um, I'm welcoming uh, Jan Gustav Strandenes, uh, uh, who is uh, both engaged uh, in the stakeholder forum uh, for UNEP and also in the 2022 Initiative Foundation. And the topic will be what is the legacy of the Stockholm Conference in, in 1972 and how does it relate to what UNEP is doing today and tomorrow. So a short presentation from you, Jan Gustav, is what we can anticipate right now. Yes, I hope so. Even though uh, uh, speaking about 50 years of history may take a long time, but I have promised to be short and succinct, which is always a challenge for me. Um, I was in Stockholm in 1970, and I also want to recognize Arthur Dahl, who is in, in, in the audience here, who actually was a lobbyist, whereas I was running around as an intern and as a volunteer for the Moy Strong Secretariat, having been recruited by my friend at the time, Wayne Kynes, who became the first director of information at UNEP. But that's history. I had, uh, it was awakening call for me when he was environmental issues on policy level. Uh, even though I had been working on the environment at the time for almost 10 years. Uh, I would say with a, with a reference to, to the legacy, and I'm very happy that um, uh, Ambassador Pat said that uh, the, uh, the background is important. Um, there's, a, there's a need and a plethora of reasons to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the World's Environment Organization. And there is an equal need to commemorate and celebrate the Stockholm meeting, which back in 1972 began the existence of this organization. 
And as Ambassador Pite said, the Stockholm Conference name was the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment. This conference established an environmental process that has through 50 years had a ripple of advant advantageous effects on environmental work and policies. And there's an urgent need to strengthen these trends today and diversify them, intensify them and made, made them uh, actual to today's and tomorrow's challenges. The legacy of the Stockholm meeting should be clearly identified and viewed as a platform today to spur environmental research policies and solutions to existing environmental problems. And with the experience of 50 years of environmental work, this legacy should also be an incitement to develop systems to identify emerging issues and act on credible evidence predicting possible future environmental trends. Uh, <clears throat> the 1972 Stockholm Conference had agreed on a quite a momentous uh, uh, outcome. Uh, they agreed on 26 principles on environment and development. They, act, they agreed on a detailed program of action consisting of 109 paragraphs, and they also agreed on a number of resolutions. Now, if we take a critical look at all these resolutions, we see that they very much also reflect the thinking of that day. Uh, basically, a lot of countries uh, did not take environment seriously, and they still don't. But uh, pointing out a few concrete um, elements of this legacy, I would say that by founding, by the Stockholm Conference and its foundation of the UNEP, uh, in, in actually starting up in 1973, the world was given a global institutional home for environmental law. This is extremely important. It was also the beginning of environmental governance, another very uh, very important and, and uh, uh, futuristic decision back in 1972. This was this has also to become an institution to connect science with the environment. Although, contrary to what many think, uh, UNESCO had through its Man and Biosphere program began science and environment a few years before. But UNEP put a an accelerated pace to this. The Stockholm Conference would also allow uh, civil society and NGO to access the plenary uh, on a regular basis. And this created a precedence, changing subsequent UN conferences forever, allowing greater participation from civil society and NGOs. This was a first, it had never happened before in the history of the UN. Um, I would also say that environmental diplomacy became in earnest at that time. And we also had the first sort of confluence of environmental assessment and management issues. One interesting historical fact and also of political importance, I think, to talk about the legacy, the only head of state from abroad who participated in the Stockholm Conference in 1972 was Indira Gandhi of India. Clearly, the Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme at the time uh, opened a conference with, with her, but her opening statement at the conference was deemed to be one of the most significant ones. She clearly saw the need to safeguard the environment and one of her passages came to be included among the 26 principles at the time. And her understanding with also the rest of, of the leadership, including Morris Strong and Olaf Palmer, um, should be celebrated for this, this, uh, this principle. And I quote, man, she said, has a special responsibility to safeguard and wisely manage the heritage of wildlife and its habitat which are now gravely imperiled by a combination of adverse factors. Nature conservation, including wildlife, must therefore receive importance in planning for economic development. Today we might say, so what? Don't we all know this? But at the time this was revolutionary and we started to do something which was very important. The outcome of this first conference also inspired a number of interesting conferences immediately in the aftermath of UNEP. Um, you have to, we have to realize that at the time, the environment was thought to be actually an aberration in development, and the non-aligned nations at the time claimed that the environment and its problems was something that only belonged to the North, the industrialized North, and was looked upon as a luxury. And some also said bringing the environment into policies is just going to undermine our efforts to fight extreme poverty. Um, there was some truth to that, but not at all. Or, all encompassing. So Maurice Strong, as the executive director of UNEP, began immediately to organize a number of interesting fact-finding conferences. And one such conference took place during the autumn of 1974 in Mexico. 
He did this with the executive director of UNCTAD at the time, uh, Gamani Korea. And uh, they produced a very interesting outcome declaration called the Kokoyok Declaration, now basically forgotten. But I'd like to finish my statement because this points to the legacy under forward-looking thinking at the time. In this uh, epilogue, you find everything. You find the uh, plenary boundaries, the donut economy, building back better or building forward better, the green transition, all of these elements are actually outlined in the Kokoyok Declaration. And this, this fascinating declaration also um, represents well what Timothy Snyder, the Yale historian has said, history does not repeat, but it does instruct. So let me finish my statement with the epilogue from the Kokoyok Declaration. It reads as follows. We recognize the threats to both the inner limits of basic human needs and the outer limits of the planet's physical resources. But we also believe that a new sense of respect for fundamental human rights and for the preservation of our planet is growing up behind the angry divisions and confrontations of our day. We have faith in the future of mankind on this planet. We believe that ways of life and social systems can be evolved that are more just less arrogant in their material demands, more respectful of the whole planetary environment. The road forward does not lie through the despair of doom watching or through the easy optimism of successful technological access. It lies through a careful and dispassionate assessment of the outer limits through cooperative search for ways to achieve the inner limits of fundamental human rights, through the building of social structures to express those rights and through all the patient work of devising techniques and styles of development which enhance and preserve our planetary inherent inheritance. It was said in 1974, we've been, we've been inspired by this. This is clearly also one of the momentous legacies of the Stockholm uh, plus fifth, the Stockholm Conference. And giving an understanding to this to UNEP and to Stockholm today is a momentous birthday uh, gift. Action now has become a rallying cry, and action now means implementing the 2030 agenda, protect the environment, and safeguard the future and well being for all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jan Gustav. Uh, a bigger round of applause, uh, even if you can't hear all of us. Uh, thank you very much for putting the questions of today in this broader context and, and also uh, relating to that, even if, as you said, that we, uh, it reflects the thinking of the day, uh, the thinking often goes more wider than what the doing does. So thank you very much. And uh, we also welcome next speaker. Uh, we have a very interesting topic, which Johanna already mentioned, and that's to inspire and relate to the youth. And uh, we welcome Teresa Oberhaus, our uh, global coordinator of the youth constituency of UNEP. And the topic is how can UNEP at 50, uh, the, um, the, um, 50 year conference and the Stockholm Plus 50 conference contribute to the youth's demand for action now. So that's the topic and uh, most welcome Teresa all the way from Netherlands. Thank you very much. Um... Perfect. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for this uh, nice introduction. It, it is a great pleasure to be here um, and uh, uh, be invited to this uh, to this session. Um, my name is Teresa Oberhauser. I am indeed one of the two coordinators of the Youth Constituency, which is the open uh, universal platform of youth engagement where young people on a voluntary basis um, engage with each other globally on environmental topics and with UNEP and in the negotiation processes and uh, to move forward on environmental governance together. A very a, a challenging question. Please uh, let me know if I'm going over time. <laughs> How can UNEP at 50 and Stockholm Plus 50 contribute to the youth demand for action now? Um, it's very hard to summarize the youth demand that we hear globally. Um, in one sentence, but the most important ones probably are more ambition when it comes to environmental governance and environmental protection, more inclusivity when it comes to youth engagement and the possibilities of young people to engage and the creation of an enabling environment for young people to, to get involved, to be part of the solution, to be part of the implementation. Talking at a Swedish event, I am, I am honored and I, I know you know what I mean um, when it comes to those kind of youth, uh, youth movements. And that is, that is amazing. So what has to be done? We need to move faster and we need to make more substantial change. 
crises this like COVID should not just derail our governmental uh, activities and our intergovernmental practices. If you look at the predictions about um, environmental degradation, about extreme weather events that are linked to the climate change that we all experience, we know that there will be more situations, maybe not as crazy as the COVID situation right now, but there will be malaria in Europe. There will be more situations where, um, where different um, diseases emerge. There will be climate migration that will struck um, a lot of countries um, globally. So we will have to learn to deal with the situation and to not pause our, our activities that are happening at the moment in governments, in business, businesses, in societies, and also among youth. So what role does Stockholm plus 50 and UNEP at 50 play? I think it is amazing to hear from the speakers here that have experience in those in, in those conferences. And I think it is an amazing opportunity to really analyze what are the things, the commitments that were, were um, basically made back then, what are the plans that were let out, set out back then, and what are the things that worked and what did not work. Um, also, to simply just see what are really the things that work. I think, especially among young young people now, there is no uh, there are no negative feelings or there is no anger about the things that went wrong. This is all a learning process for young people, for people in government positions, decision makers, businesses. This is a learning process, and we just have to all be able to look back and really analyze what are the things that we did with the knowledge we had and what are the things we did right and what are the things that could be better. And then really with an open mind jointly move together with a really proactive mindset of where can we all move together and what are the things that we know now that can allow us to move forwards together, all of us, young, old, decision makers, businesses, society. So how can it be done? What are the most important changes we hope to see in the Stockholm Plus 50 and UNEP at 50 and UNEF 5.2? We need innovation, we need potential, and we need uh, to see these conferences really as, as innovative potential of uh, creating new steps. UNEAS always have a very similar way of going. Many intergovernmental processes are very similar, but Stockholm plus 50 and UNIBED 50 are new conferences without a clear structure. So there's a lot of potential to really see how can we make the structure, how can we make the, the engagement possibilities really meaningful to really re re um, achieve outcomes that are going to bring us further and not in an innovative way, because that's what we're all really longing to do. No matter who we talk to, governments, businesses, everyone is going in that direction. So I think we've learned from the COVID situation, intergovernmental uh, processes are crucial. And that's also what uh, young people are really, um, are really experiencing and believe. So how can we strengthen those intergovernmental processes? So what are the intergovernmental mechanisms that work? I'll be honest, I'm not an expert. And most of the analysis that we have done uh, shows that it's very difficult. But we have seen that resolutions alone are not enough. So let us explore together what are the mechanisms that are actually going to work and that go further than those resolutions. How can we be faster? Well, one of the possibilities to be faster is to go online. We have no time to postpone on uh, intergovernmental conferences. We have no time to to postpone UNEAS and to have half UNEAS this year and half UNEAS next year. We have to be more ambitious. There are a lot of possibilities, especially online right now, even with virtual reality bilateral meetings of ministers. Those things sound very freaky, but they are possible and they are already working across many countries. And no, of course, ambassadors do not have to go this way alone. We understand that there are new technologies and challenges, but there are young people that are able to help. There are also offices that are already now facilitating the platform for the ambassadors to really speak freely and have the platform that they need to engage with each other. Because, of course, there needs to be confidence between delegations, but we will be able to ensure that online. So Stockholm Plus 50 and UNEP at 50 can be a great moment to show what is possible. And it can be a possibility to reach more people, to reach beyond the people that are usually able to travel to those conferences, because the more options of conferences that are in line, the further we can go together. We have a youth environment assembly planned uh, next week where we have up to 10,000 young people that can get engaged without spending a single euro on traveling costs. This is an enabling environment. And that is something that Stockholm Plus 50 and UNIP at 50 can definitely show as well. And where we already seen a lot of amazing ideas from the government of, uh, of Sweden and also from UNEP. So we're really encouraging. It's very encouraging to see that. What else has to happen? 
we need a decentralized enabling um, environment. So we need less hierarchies and we need more freedom and more flexibility and decentralized management when it comes to environmental governance. The ecosystem restoration strategy of UNEP has shown that it is actually possible to really create a more open structure without clear hier hierarchies on who is going to work on what, but rather to build a movement, to build an open support community of businesses, civil society, governments that want to walk towards more ecosystem restoration and that can decentrally online coordinate and really do activities on the ground towards more ecosystem restoration. This is just an example, but uh, Fridays for Future is another amazing example that goes that direction. Online coordination and open decentralized structures are actually enabling. If you look around, there are a lot of examples already. For example, in many countries, the Corona apps that are supporting us in managing Corona have been created by, created by small groups of people that have organized themselves and presented amazing ideas to governments. We have, when we look at software, there are, there's a free software foundation and many people, also young people globally, they work on free software that is as good as the closed source software that we have, purely volunteer based and purely free. We have examples of youth constituencies and other major groups that many of you are partners of and um, that work in a decentralized way that engage themselves and coordinate. Those decentralized enabling structures are actually possible and we need public mechanisms that can actually support that where actually those kind of platforms are created and where people can apply and in a simple and organized um, fashion can support on those issues. Um, so what can be done to be more ambitious? How can we have more practical outcomes of intergovernmental inter conference conferences? How can countries support each other to achieve those kind of goals? There are many examples of NDC partnerships, of um, voluntary national reviews and other mechanisms that are already showing the right way. And I'm sure there are many possibilities to analyze that and go further in that direction. The societies are ready and also um, looking beyond this, there are many parts of our societies and businesses that are ready. I am during my professional capacity working in a circular economy startup. And one of the most important things we hear there all the time is that companies for more than 10 years have their blueprints in the drawer about how to become more circular, how to implement circular design on their products and how to use more recycled materials. They just need a clear, clear message from the government that this is the point we're now going to do that. Businesses have been flexible for a very long time. Working in a startup, it, I hear it on a daily basis that it is very normal that startups grow and startups die and, um, and there are um, investments, investment companies. So it is normal, that flexibility is normal. So we um, can expect those kind of flexibilities from businesses and governments can actually make ambitious steps forward because businesses have been, have been there and have been prepared for more than 10 years. Okay. One last sentence, I know I'm okay, done. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we invite you to be ambitious. We invite youth, uh, we would like to, for youth to be invited to be part of the whole processes of enabling those transitions from the ideation phase to the start. We need enabling structures for youth so they can be part of that and they can um, really be part of the implementing force. So we need to think out of the box. If we think about the situation that we will have to live with 20% of the carbon emissions that we are living with right now, if we want to make climate change situations work, and if we want to move forward together as humanity, then we know we have to be innovative, we have to be flexible, and there will be a lot of changes that will be necessary. So young people invite you to be innovative and flexible and move in that direction. Thank you, Thank very, you much. very much, Teresa. A warm applause for you also, um, even if you don't hear it. So, um, and, and I suggest we all get uh, very innovative and flexible right now because we are moving into the first dialogue round. So this is how it will work. We have prepared uh, rooms for you, uh, breakout uh, rooms uh, with approximately four people in each. And uh, right now in the chat, you have um, a link, a direct link to a... Um, uh, Google Forms, uh, at least one of you need to take notes, but all of you can, uh, so that's the setup. Uh, you're going to use the same um, uh, form for both dialogue round one and dialogue round two, so we will keep the rooms and, uh, as they are, but you will be in the first dialogue round for approximately 15 minutes, 
And uh, when there is one minute left, you will get a notification from, uh, from Zoom. And then we will all meet up here in the, in the large room again, and we will move on with the, with the next topic and uh, moving forward to the next dialogue round. We have also seen that there have been a big interest for this dialogue meeting. So what we have done is that we have created an extra round, a third round, which is after the formal meeting. So those of you who want to have more dialogues and networking, we have new questions and new ideas and, and, new, and, and, and a new form for that. But uh, now we're going to start dialogue round one. And there are instructions also in the, in the um, um, form itself. So it, it, it will be quite easy for you to follow. So please copy the, the link that was in the chat. I put it there again. So it's the last link that you have. And uh, most welcome and have fun in the rooms. And we we'll see you back here in approximately 15 minutes. I will now open the rooms. And then there is like a, a sign coming up and saying, join the room. You need to click that. And don't forget to have fun. Uh, we will move on in with the program now, and um, we have more interesting speakers uh, coming up. And um, next topic is UNEP is the institutional home of the environmental law. Civil society is interested on what is called the Global Pact for the Environment, and how can this inspire an outcome from the Stockholm Plus conference. And uh, for the reason to, to give us a, a presentation on this topic. We have invited Leida Reinhardt, uh, expert on environmental justice and the global pact for the environment. So, uh, um, well, the scene is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I'm using an, um, a PowerPoint. That should work. So please just click on the share screen. I think you see my screen now. Yes. Okay, so, so well, thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation to start with. It's really a pleasure to be here and to um, well, to see you all. The dialogue was also nice. Um, so I'm here to explain you a little bit about the Global Pact for the Environment. Uh, not a lot of people know about it, and I think it's very important, and especially related to Stockholm Plus Fifty and UNEP Plus Fifty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the Global Pact for the Environment is an initiative that was taken by 100 environmental lawyers, experts over 40 countries. They wrote, um, I mean, an, 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 a thick document on um, many principles on environmental law that was called the Global Pact for the Environment. One of those lawyers was a friend of, uh, or is a friend of President uh, Macron, and he convinced him to bring that ID to the General Assembly in, in New York. And that happened in 2018. And um, quite surprisingly, the General Assembly uh, agreed on that because the Global Pact is quite um, progressive, even radical, I think, in some forms. But um, maybe everybody was just at that time at the toilet. It went through the General Assembly. And um, so it, it started the process. Um, the process was done under ECOSOC, so that's New York. Um, two uh, co-chairs, um, I'm not going to go into in too much details, you see the photos and the names on the screen. They started a process, we had four meetings, um, one in New York, three in Nairobi, to see a civil society, because I'm coming from an, a civil society organization, um, I facilitated those meetings uh, as well at that time uh, to see what uh, could be done, uh, where we are, what member states think about it, etc., etc. Of course, not all member states were very uh, happy with this uh, Global Pact for the Environment because when they hear something on rights, when they hear something on legally binding, when they hear something about accountability, um, then they, uh, they, they, uh, they are not always uh, agreeing on that. So that was a quite difficult process, but it, it, it went. I think the co-chairs also did, an, did, a good, uh, did a good job. Um, what was done after that? I mean, after those meetings, uh, there was an, an, um, an, a report, a technical and evidence-based report that identified and also assessed possible gaps in the international environmental law. Because of course, there were a lot of countries to say, well, we do have a lot of environmental law already. We do have MEAs, uh, multilateral environmental agreements. But uh, the problem, of course, is as always, if even if you have good law, is the enforcement of it. I mean, you, paper is patient, as we say in, in, in Holland. So it, it's, it has to be enforced and it has to be put in practical actions. 
uh, I have to say, and we were very happy with that, that during those um, meetings, those four uh, meetings, there was active NGO participation, including the group that wrote the Global Pact for the Environment. I mean, not all 40 um, ones, but I mean, there were several lawyers that were involved in, the, in writing the uh, Global Pact for the Environment were also part in, this, in those uh, meetings. It went back to the General Assembly and then they said that uh, it will be and there will be a follow up uh, on this so um, to see what was uh, what was possible. Um, as they also saw that it was maybe not uh, the best place to uh, discuss uh, a global pact for the environment in New York, because in New York, there are not all the environmental experts, the people working and dialoguing, negotiating on, on, on environment are of course based in, in, in Nairobi, where UNEP is uh, the headquarter that has. So that's uh, why the, the next process was uh, organized and led by, uh, by UNEP. Uh, so now it's a UNEA process. Uh, those are the two co-chairs that started the process. And one of the things that they have as main objective, and I have to admit that, yes, it isn't kind of watering down on where we started, but that's normal in when you're part of UN processes, you come with a bright idea. And then of course, there is that, that kind of tendency to water it down, but I really hope that we can get it on a higher level again. So what is the idea now from them? The main objective is to develop, to write, to draft, a political declaration for a United Nations high, high level meeting. Um, I'm not going to read the text, you can do it by yourself, but one of the things that we as civil society thought that Stockholm plus 50, UNEP 50 are the best high level uh, meetings where we can have that declaration. And that is of course also the idea now from the co-chairs. Um, as civil society, as, we, as I said, we were quite active, we were quite involved as well, we have good relationships with, uh, with, with the co-chairs for the moment, we have um, dialogues with, uh, with them, so now and then, even if it's not, uh, let's say, official, we have informal, uh, um, I mean, communication with, uh, with them. Of course, a declaration should be more than words. We don't want uh, in, in Stockholm that they say, well, uh, environmental governance, environmental law is so important and we need to do something uh, because that will then again go into the archives and uh, we will never hear, hear about it anymore. So what we are really demanding as civil society organizations, because we think that UNEP is the place where uh, you can work on environmental law and environmental governance is that uh, Stockholm plus 50 <clears throat> could be the kickoff of an inclusive to develop a, a legally binding or not. I mean, that's something you can discuss, of course, but at least a framework to strengthen environmental law and governance. That's absolutely important because for now, the environmental law is quite weak. And if it's strong, it's not enforced. Um, that's why we have so much environmental damage because it's a kind of free thing to do. I mean, uh, still until now, uh, environmental damage or ecocide, if it's in the, in the, in, 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 on the big scale, is still not a crime. It's a kind of cost, but not a crime. So that's something where we really think that environmental law and governance should be strengthened. That needs to be a whole package, uh, just like the SDGs. I mean, it has to have the principles, but we have them agreed. We have agreed principles everywhere in the Rio uh, Declaration, in the Agenda 21, and uh, also done in that Global Pact, I think, but we have to pick out the, the, the principles that are most important. Also goals, um, targets, indicators, and monitoring tools and means of implementation. So we are referring to the process that was done with the SDGs. Uh, it was also in Rio plus 20, where the government said, the member states said, okay, we have to develop a package of a sustainable development goals. And then we came up with the 2030 agenda. It took also three years to have that one. So that's why we're now also thinking we can use three years or more, two years. I mean, that's also something we decide on. We can decide and we can see how, how long that takes to have at the end a real framework on environmental law and governance. It has to be a worldwide campaign together with worldwide capacity building and also worldwide integration in all law departments of the universities because a lot of lawyers, judges are not knowing not a lot about environmental law. The framework should include enforcement of the rule of law on all levels, the monitoring tools, as I said, but also coordination of existing MEAs. There is already a lot of environmental law there, but not enforced, and people do not 
do, just do not know about it. Agree on basic principles, then you can refer to the Global Pact for the Environment, but as I said, also to other um, papers that are agreed already by the member states. It's filling in the gaps of existing environmental law and as I said, capacity building for all the peoples that are in involved in that. Funds for capacity building, exchange of info, and there we can also refer to the Montevideo program where um, that is also uh, agreed. Are you in the end so, of the presentation here, Leida? Almost. So, yeah, okay. so um, we are running up with time. To make to make it concrete, uh, I think I already drafted some text for you. I took it out of Rio Plus Twenty, but I adapted it to and to environmental law and uh, environmental governance. Uh, so this is the text that we can use and lobby for to have that one in the declaration at Stockholm plus 50. Of course, we can discuss about it, but I think it is something that is absolutely possible to have that uh, agreed uh, for uh, for the member states in uh, in Stockholm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leila. Uh, super interesting. And I really like the integrating part of it. So it uh, doesn't like separate it again I, you have to put it together and um, we're going to into the next topic here and this is the um, the, the longest topic if, if you measure the number of the did <laughs> number of letters and uh, for this uh, occasion we have uh, invited Anna Sundström Secretary General of Olof Palme International Center so on the topic the late Prime Minister of Sweden of Palme referred to the environmental destruction as the ecocide of the Stockholm Conference in 1972. Should the idea of ecocide be included in the final document of Stockholm Plus 50? And you are already talking about this in, in, in the chat, I see. And if so, why and how can this be done? So uh, a short presentation from Anna Sundström, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. So I have uh, the longest title to this uh, shortest little <laughs> intervention, I, th I think, but I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the Olaf Palme International Center works in the spirit of Olaf Palme for peace, democracy and human rights with the conviction that none can fully be achieved without the other and that social justice is a prerequisite for them both to be sustainable. And in this perspective, of course, human rights and environmental rights uh, are intertwined. We have created and accepted a economic system that profit on both and we need to put an end to exploitation. A su sustainable future must be built on solidarity with all living things. Well, you all know also that uh, the, uh, the concept of ecocide was also mentioned uh, by Olaf Palme in the 1972 conference. So I shall not uh, use more time to go into exactly what he said at that time. But uh, he also stated that uh, his fear that uh, the active use of uh, uh, these methods that destroy our environment uh, are coupled with a passive resistance to discuss them. And uh, sadly, this passive resistance has been true for far too long. And only recently, and I would like to underline this, through the hard work of Endecocide, things are finally moving. Um, Almost 50 years later, we know that too little has been done in this regard and time is currently running out. We need to do more. And it is against this backdrop that government leaders will once again gather in Stockholm in June 2022. And I absolutely think that this is a unique opportunity to honor the words of Olof Palme, to be brave, to show leadership and boldness to also achieve what he already 50 years ago uh, was looking for, far reaching changes in attitudes and social structures. And also finally to, to make sure that killing nature is criminalized. They'll, this will require strong international legislation uh, against large scale environmental degradation. And also at said, uh, it needs to be more than words. It needs a strong framework. And I truly believe that there is a possibility for a breakthrough now. The movement, the support is growing. And we must, of course, also make sure that political will is there, because political will has been lacking. But in order to have political will, we also need to have voters will, because the politicians will listen to, to the voters. 
and for this to keep on going with the information campaigning etc as as many of us are already doing is of course crucial we still have some time but uh, uh, 2022 and the conference is, is uh, approaching very quickly and also we must of course not be naive this is still a controversial concept there are still prejudice and lack of knowledge fear of course from not the least the business sector but also government leaders and so on and skepticism also not the least among developing countries for centuries we the rich world uh, the rich countries of the world built our wealth on predation and there is a feeling of injustice here that we cannot shy away from. So this brings me to solidarity. It is truly time for more of solidarity and international cooperation. We have a moral responsibility to support the developing countries and their efforts to mitigate climate change in building sustainable societies. Yet what we see is the opposite. International aid is shrinking. International cooperation is being questioned and multilateralism is backsliding. So this conference is also extremely important in this setting. Uh, Olaf Palme also, he said in his speech that in the field of human environment, there is no individual future, neither for humans nor for nations. Our future is common. We must share it and we must share it together and we must not the least shape it together. And uh, let me just end by saying that I truly believe that the importance of a strong international framework uh, against the, what we see in so many places, the killing of, of our own uh, environment, is something. The time is right for this. And uh, the Stockholm Conference, I really hope that we together can make sure that we take this necessary step into strengthening also the international framework uh, to truly make this happen. Thank you very much, Anna, and a round of applause for you too. Uh, and uh, also for Leda, I don't know if we did it for you already, but uh, here we go. And we have uh, one more aspect before next dialogue round, and uh, the aspect is the business aspect. And uh, for that reason, we have invited Marcus Milfeld from Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, where you work as an expert on, on uh, sustainability. And the question is, how can Unia 5 theme and Stockholm Plus conference, uh, 50 conference increase engagement from business to become environmentally sustainable and integrate the SDGs into their core business, the core? So welcome, Marcus, and uh, the scene is yours. And uh, a short presentation, please. Absolutely, I will do my best. Thank you very much, Stellan, and thank you very much for the invitation and the possibility to participate during this dialogue meeting today and be part of the preparation for the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. My organization, the Confederation of Swedish Enterprise, consists of 60,000 member companies from all sectors that work with and contribute to the SDGs and the green transition in many different ways. The business sector plays a central role for the sustainable development goals in Agenda 2030 Business is central for the development of society, not the least in creating job opportunities, but also in providing innovative solutions to environmental challenges, such as tackling climate change and promote increased circularity. Agenda 2030 brings together the three dimensions of sustainability. This, the balance between the three pillars, is something that we in the business sector believe is crucial. A sustainable economy is a prerequisite for a sustainable social and ecological future and vice versa. It's essential to keep in mind that we must have a balance between the different goals. Today I would like especially to emphasize how the business sector contributes to a better environment. Technological development and innovations create solutions that are the answer to many of the challenges connected to, for example, climate change and the use of scarce resources that are pointed out in the SDGs. We have many examples of Swedish companies that contribute to this work in a very positive way with their products and knowledge. For Sweden and the EU to stay at the forefront of global climate action, we must ensure not only that emission decrease and reach net zero by 2050, but also that businesses and societies continue to grow. 
only by proving that it's possible to combine decreased emissions with economic growth will the EU truly be a role model which inspires the rest of the world to follow in our tracks. By creating conditions for business to develop and invest in low carbon solutions, we can both reduce our own emissions as well as export solutions that reduces emissions globally. It is vital that policymakers must therefore create beneficial conditions for this important development to continue and accelerate. I would therefore like to highlight two factors that are important for the business sector in Sweden when it comes to the green transition. First of all, approval processes. They must become more predictable, predictable and efficient in order to promote transition and globally decreased emissions. Secondly, access to fossil free electri electricity is key to enable the industry and the transport sector to phase out the use of fossil fuels. A well functioning cost effective electricity system with a high level of security of supply is an important enabler for the electrification of our society. I would also like to emphasize that most of the spendings that are allocated to research and development actually come from the private sector. These investments are vital to develop new technology and foster innovations that are sustainable and in line with the Agenda 2030. The Swedish business community has come far and sustainability is already incorporated in business strategies. This goes for both small and medium sized companies together with larger ones, even though there are differences in terms of how sustainability are addressed and communicated. Finally, creativity and innovation can show that new business cases can go hand in hand with contributing to the SDGs. Uh, I'm therefore proud to represent the Swedish business community and grateful to be able to participate during this important dialogue meeting today. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking forward to further cooperation. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, round of applause for you too. Thank and uh, we're moving into the dialogue meeting so all of us can engage again. Uh, you're pretty much in the same constellations. We have done some, uh, some corrections just so that uh, everyone has a room. Uh, we have new people coming in. And in the chat, there is now the same link. Uh, and as you already, uh, once of you already um, have the dialogue round one, you just continue in the same form. Otherwise, you open it up if you need. So I open the rooms and uh, a five plus dialogue round. Uh, we will be back here at 12.50. So uh, have fun. Here we go. I think now everyone is back. And uh, please uh, submit your uh, answers or whatever we call it to the forms. And uh, we're moving into the last part of the formal meeting. And before we do that, I'm just going to again add that there after the formal meeting, there will be a short break. Uh, five, five minutes approximately and then for those of you who want to uh, engage in more dialogue and networking we will scramble all the rooms and um, put you in new constellations and we have two more questions uh, in a third round for those of you who want that uh, but before ending the formal meeting we have uh, a part called conclusions and I, I now add the short one minute statements from the panelists as a call to action and first of the panelists or the speakers uh, I again welcome Ambassador Johan, uh, Johanna Lissinger Peitz. Welcome. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, I think, to all of the speakers for having been very inspiring. Um, not sure if a conclusion, but I think the key words that I heard is uh, implementation, implementation, implementation. With that aside, also the importance of solidarity, um, the discussion on governance in different formats, very interesting. The one thing I would like to bring up is the word that Teresa used uh, in her statement, and that is innovation. Uh, I heard innovation for more ambition, for more implementation, for the meeting format, which I find extremely interesting. Uh, innovation linked to the importance of creating enabling environments for youth participation. Uh, so very short, but these are some of the messages that I think I will take with me in, in our further work. And Thanks again to, to you for having organized this session. Thanks. Thank you very much, Johanna. Uh, next uh, speaker out to uh, make some conclusions or concluding remarks or, or points for action is uh, Jan Gustav Strandenes. Welcome again. 
Thank you so much uh, for this. And thank you for a very interesting discussion. Summarizing this is not going to be easy, but I have four points. Um, UNIP and uh, UNEA and uh, Stockholm plus 50 and UNIPA 50 should always focus on the environmental of the uh, dimension of the SDGs. That's their merit and that's what they're good at and that needs to be highlighted and not forgotten. The second thing is uh, also what was mentioned a number of times, the enforcement of environmental law. That's a big, big challenge and I saw in the chat room that several people pointed to the fact that Enforcement of environmental law may also perhaps bring as support to the environmental defenders who are being murdered, as we as we know. The, uh, this, the third point is look at the budget of UNEP. I think the fact that UNEP is struggling to, to finance everything it's trying to do is, is proof that governments still do not take the environment seriously. If you put together the budgets of WWF and Greenpeace, that sum is bigger than the operative than the budget of UNEP. And that's a disgrace. And the final one is give youth a chance, uh, give youth money to organize a Stockholm Plus 50 meeting. They can do it and they don't have to do it with us. So be on your own, be creative as you were back in 2019 with the Social Su Sustainability Summit and do it greatly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Gustav. Uh, next uh, speaker to uh, give us some conclusions is Teresa Oberhauser. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Um, to summarize the, the first uh, group discussion, what we had, one of the most important things that came up was uh, compliance and how the, even the, the idea that there would be a lack of compliance from companies that have maybe, let's say, troubled governments or troubled economic situations actually also discourages other countries and even European countries that have the financial means to comply with the, with the basically goals that they have set out actually end up not complying with that whole understanding. So how can we actually you, uh, stop this basically struggle downwards and actually make it a struggle upwards and have this reinforcing factor for the, for the countries they can and enough support for the countries uh, that cannot. Um, I had an emergency where I had to jump out during the second group, so maybe one of the colleagues there can yeah. fill we, on, we, on we that just, discussion. We just move on here because we are ending uh, the first formal pod, so thank you very much, Teresa. Uh, next speaker uh, is Laida Reinaut. Yes. So welcome back again. <laughs> thank you. I think what is uh, most important, what I, I, I heard is indeed about uh, giving back uh, governments uh, the lead in, in uh, regulating uh, markets, uh, which also includes uh, legal framework. Um, as you know, the rights for a safe and clean environment is also in human rights. The Secretary General also um, um, stresses that very much. So that is something that we need to, to focus on. And UNEP is, of course, the, the, the body that has the mandate to do that. So strengthening environmental law and, uh, and, uh, and governance. Um, I think the time is now also the, the pandemic shows uh, quite well that the way we treat uh, nature, the, tr the way we treat uh, animals uh, is causing this uh, this pandemic. So I think it is absolutely a need that we do that very fast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leida. Uh, next coming up is uh, Anna Sundström. Uh, so um, welcome back, Anna. What are your call for action? Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, I have not been able to participate in the in the whole conference, so it's hard to me, for me to, to uh, summarize in any way, but uh, my call to action, I think that we must also recognize the fact that political will has been lacking, uh, but it has also been lacking due to the fact that the this issues has not been too high up on the or high up enough uh, on on the voters agendas and now that we see that this momentum is uh, growing we really need to make all our efforts uh, to also push uh, the time is now no thank you very much the time is now and marcus Mufelt, the last of our speakers your call to action Thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. And as I mentioned, the business sector plays a central role in reaching a sustainable development. What is required, required now is that our companies are given the opportunity to invest in the green transition and that the obstacles to change are removed. And therefore, from a Swedish perspective, this means, for example, that the approval processes must be accelerated and that access to electricity is ensured. Thank you very much for today. Thank you very much, Marcus. And uh, last but not least, uh, Helena, uh, give us your call to action before we round up the, the first uh, part, uh, the formal part of this meeting. Well, my call to action would be in brief 
to just let's participate and let's just join our next uh, dialogue meeting, which is planned for uh, around mid uh, March. Uh, and uh, we will also send out uh, uh, the conclusions from this meeting to all of you. Uh, and of course, the invitation to the next dialogue meeting, because we need to act together and to act fast. Mm -hmm. And as I look here, uh, I still uh, need a room one, two, and I guess nine, ten to submit your uh, answers from the forms. So don't forget to do that uh, before you leave. Um, and before you leave, there is this opportunity to not wait for our next dialogue and, and that's just to continue <laughs> after a short break. But first of all, I will, uh, on both my behalf and, and Helena's behalf, and I would say thank you, first of all, to, to all, all of you and also to all of our speakers and and uh, and for your engagement, uh, all of you, to, in the dialogues. And um, I would say uh, the future is something we create together. So let's uh, do that. And thank you again for participating. And those of you who want to, to have uh, another round of dialogue and networking, we will scramble the rooms in five minutes. But first of all, thank you. And uh, see you soon again, I hope. Thanks. Thank you very much, Remember. all of you. The, like to remind you that you submit the, the answers in, in the form. And I will also say some, um, some concluding uh, remarks about the, for, the, the, the form we have used today, the, di the digital um, meeting and the digital dialogue. This is actually the first uh, digital, totally digital dialogue that uh, Initiative 2022 have arranged. So, uh, and, and as you see, it's quite possible. So uh, what happens is that we, we also broaden the spectrum of, of people to be able to engage. Uh, so today we have had people from, uh, I think, 10 countries, which would be, have been a big problem if we would have met physically. <laughs> <laughs> and Martin, you want to say something? As, uh, or did you just, okay, yeah. And um, so what I want you to, uh, to really do is to engage in each other and make sure that you have contacts to each other uh, from the rooms that you were in and uh, connect. <laughs> and also if you want to use the workshops we have used today, you can use the short links and, and uh, conduct them in your own organizations or together with other people and so on. And um, just feel free to, to use it. And, and we, we don't, um, I mean, of course you, you have written some names and stuff like that, but we will, uh, what do you call it? An anonymize, anonymize them. That's what you call it. Yeah, anonymize them. So thank you very much from my perspective. And uh, Jan Gustav, you wanted to say something also in, in uh, some concludings uh, for, for the meetings today. Um, um, am I on? Yes, you are. Okay. Well, not necessarily, but because I, I have a tendency to talk a lot. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm usually using my time more than others. Uh, and, um, but, but yeah, I think these dialogue meetings are very important. And in, in the experience I have um, with issues like Ecoside or like the Global Pact for Nature or, you know, giving proper content to UNIP at, at 50 and Stockholm plus 50, the more we talk about it, the more ideas we engender. And I, I've, never, I've never felt the need to respect the, the, the concept of this is impossible. You know, I've, I'm, there's no need to, to, uh, to be confronted by the so-called truth that, that people are saying, you can't do it because it's never done before. Um, we, we, uh, we have a golden opportunity and we have, I think, a moral obligation to the environment and to the future generations to be constructive in this. Um, and, um, and so the dialogue sessions that we're engaged in here are hugely important. You, you, you define an issue like ecocide, for instance, or like the Global Pact for the Environment, and you push forward and something will, will come out of it. I, again, I would just end what I'm, I, I will emphasize what I, I keep saying, let the youth get some funds and organize themselves the way they did before the 2019 Summit on Sustainable Development. They, they created these global network of, of amazing people and they pushed people inside the, the famed halls of the UN to think differently. So they should be given resources to do this and they would actually change their mind, uh, I think. Thank you very much, Jan Gustav. And Thank finally, you. Helena will be uh, given some um, air, air time here in the end of the day. 
Yes, and I would like to start with thank you, to saying thank you very much for participating in this event and for your uh, very important uh, dialogue and answers that you've submitted. Uh, and your answers will contribute to the future development of the 2022 Initiative Foundation's work. And that in turn will also uh, anonymous, anonymously, as Stellan said, uh, contribute to the development uh, of uh, the Stockholm Plus 50 conference, or that's our intention. Uh, to do that in some way. Uh, and uh, we look very much forward to seeing you in future uh, dialogue meetings. And the next one is planned to be held uh, around mid-March. Uh, and the focus of that one will be related to a follow-up of UNIA 5.1 and what has also been, been said in, in this meeting. So uh, thank you very much and uh, very welcome back again. Uh, yeah. and uh, have a great day today wherever you are and um, hopefully we'll see you soon again thanks take care everyone thank you bye thank you bye thank you, thank you very much for a good bye. meeting bye thanks. thank you